federal public. Um, a social democrat, Heinz Fischer, who himself had fled uh, from the from war, uh, war torn uh, Nazi Austria, right? And in this one statement that existed, um, he wrote, "We have to we stand against every every kind of anti-Semitism and what is called in German Fremdenfeindlichkeit, which basically means it's kind of a xenophobia." Um, it means like being against a stranger, literally speaking. So I was curious and I wrote him an email. I said, with all due respect, and you know, Hans Fischer is not, he, I would regard him as being an anti-fascist, right? He's a, so, he's a social democrat. I said, with all due respect, but why can't you name the problem? Like, what's up here? Why are we not able to speak what we are all seeing? Like, yes, it is clear he speaks about the Jews, but when they speak about the Jews here, they speak about the past. But when they speak about the present and the future, they focus on the Muslims. So there is reason and enough evidence that we should call this out and call it by its name. So that was at the time um, when I had already finished my PhD from 2009. And that was, I think, the reason why I was also intrigued to and motivated to give a voice to those who would not speak up and those who could not be heard, but who would feel um, the racial discrimination that was happening to them. And in a way, speak on behalf of those uh, people who had no space to speak up. And that kind of was the beginning of my journey in doing Islamophobia studies. One of the first, um, you know, being a political scientist and being primarily focusing, uh, focused on uh, Austrian politics, uh, in 2005, the far right basically strategically, strategically made the decision to go against Muslims and go after Muslims and mobilize the electorate on anti, around the issue of anti-Muslim mobilization. And that, that is one of the examples here. Uh, well, the, that's um, the back then the leader of the far right in Vienna during an election campaign where he would say, Vienna shall not become Istanbul. And with Istanbul, he basically refers to the largest ethnic group within Austria that is representing the Muslim population, which is Turkish people. So there is this imagination of Istanbul as uh, a center of the political power, historically speaking, but also in contemporary way of the origins of our Muslim population that are the strangers within Austrian borders. And a lot of commentators when discussing this poster were actually referring to a poster that had been uh, used for an, a similar election campaign 10 years prior to 2005, which was in 1994, when they would say, Vienna shall not become Chicago. So Chicago back then stood basically for what they would call black crime, multiculturalism, and, and diversity, right? Everything the far right would fear, because it would, it endangers potentially the purity of white identity and uh, German Austrian identity. But what was more interesting is that there was even before 1994, a much more, uh, a, 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 a very similar slogan, which was in 1910, Vienna shall not become Jerusalem by the back then mayor of Vienna from the Christian Social Party, Karl Luega, who is described in Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf as being kind of um, the heroic figure who had introduced anti-Semitism as a political uh, campaign uh, in, into Austrian party politics, all right? He's in a way the, the father of political anti-Semitism. So I was also wondering, I mean, I'm not a historian. There are much many, much, many more historians out there who could who could talk about this parallel. 
but there was no discussion. So in a way, I saw and I realized that what we are going through is something very similar to what Edward Said back then in his uh, Orientalism had called antisemitism being the secret sharer, uh, uh, antisemitism being the secret sharer of Orientalism, right? The other side of the coin. It is the figure of the Jew alongside the figure of the Muslim that constituted the other for an imagined Christian white identity back then in Andalusia and thereafter. So one of the things that I frequently had to cope with, uh, especially being um, an academic who was not confined to the ivory tower of academia, but rather somebody who was very outspoken, who um, wrote op-eds in the past, and who was also like talking in the public and raising issues and trying to critique a lot of, of what, what our societies went through, um, I realized that one of the, in, at, see, at least, I mean, that's my assumption. One of the reasons why people are so hesitant in making these kinds of uh, analogies between antisemitism and Islamophobia was basically because they wanted to deny the very existence of Islamophobia. Why? Because the history of antisemitism is had its, its peak in a way in the Holocaust and the systematic murder of 6 million people, right? So having any conversation about any parallel of antisemitism and, and Islamophobia would open up the space for thinking potentially of the ability that something like that could happen again. And since the political slogan of post-World War II Austria and Germany is ni vida, never again. This is not the, the door that we want to open. But let's silence this discussion, right? Um, I did one study on a very particular case. Um, there was a historian uh, who retired um, in 2012, 14, something like that, uh, who used to be the head of the Center for Antisemitism Studies in Berlin, Germany. Uh, Wolfgang Benz, and he opened up a discussion back in 20, 2010 um, when the ban or the minaret was discussed uh, in Switzerland, where he had a very simple argument. The argument was, if we want to understand how Muslims are treated today, we have to go back and study anti-Semitism because this will give us the lens through which we can analyze what is currently happening. And you know he was like, he was lynched in the media. <laughs> that was that was the effect uh, of his very short, very simple, not very highly academic op-ed in a daily newspaper. And there were, I think, nearly like uh, around fifty pieces that were published where people ran. I mean, some were like trying to defend him, but a large amount of the critique uh, that appeared afterwards was basically trying to discredit his position. And I think, again, that was very telling because if you look at the content of the critique, it's not so much only about not wanting to discuss anti-Semitism and Islamophobia um, <clears throat> going along each other, but rather denying the very existence of Islamophobia. Um, but again, if you want to go more into detail, um, this is one of the studies that, that, that I could uh, recommend here. So being a political scientist, I was especially interested in the way the campaigning of around the Muslim issue could be compared to the campaigning, uh, campaigning against Jews prior to the Nazi regime. And I was especially interested in the interwar period and the last decades of the Habsburg monarchy. So I looked basically into the publications of the Christian, Christian Social Party and its way of framing the, the Jewish figure. And you can see that um, on the left side here, uh, this poster um, uh, from the social Demo uh, uh, social uh, Christian Social Party, where they say at the, at, the, uh, at, uh, at the top of the poster, it says, elect Christian socials. 
And uh, at the bottom, it's written rescue Austria. And when you look at the, the eagle as a symbol here, the eagle stands uh, is the symbol of the, of the first Republic of, of Austria, basically as a country. And the snake that is around it is a red snake, hinting on one hand to the socialists as a threat. But also if you look at the bottom of the snake, how, what it is wearing, it's wearing a kippah. Right? You see that? A red kippah at the, at the head of the snake. So it is like, the idea is that the socialists, the socialist party of Austria was basically a party that would enable the, what they called Feudum, which is in, literally speaking, the Jewification yeah. of Austrian society. So interestingly, what you have then in our contemporary time is <clears throat> here again, back then the leader of the far right party, where he says, um, we are for women's rights and the social Democrats are for imposing the hijab. Basically having, trying to use the same rhetorical device of what is in, in our contemporary world called, especially widespread in, in, in far right circles, but also in, in a lot of mainstream centrist political parties, what is called the Islamization, which is the, basically the same idea as the Jewification, uh, which we had a hundred years back. And the other poster that you can see here is basically um, a governor of a conservative uh, a, a, a county uh, in Austria governed by the conservatives, which is put in a hijab uh, or a chador, more I would argue here, uh, the Iranian version where they say, well, this is our Muslim mummy, right? Why? Because again, she's enabling because of her lax ways how to treat the Muslim other, she's enabling the Islamization of our Austrian society by for instance, um, not serving pork in the kindergarten stuff like that. So these are the kind of discussions that how, uh, how the far right tries to connect these larger conspiracy theories with very everyday uh, politics that is uh, happening in Austria. Um, again, there is much more detail here. And if you want, <clears throat> this would be another article where I have explored that very much in depth, which is an in-depth analysis um, or the content and, and the rhetorical devices that have been used um, comparing anti-Semitism in the political space in the interwar period with contemporary Islamophobia <clears throat> in Austrian party politics. I'll skip that. Um, I mean, there, there is a lot of scholarship on how anti-Semitism and Islamophobia have very similar ways of many, manifestation in current debates and, and debates uh, prior to the Nazi regime. But I think there is, there is one, in, uh, one important aspect that is even used by scholars, academics who are very much arguing against my claim, which is according to them, the argument goes, anti-Semitism is a self-sufficient category, which is, it explains itself in and out of itself, which means anti-Semitism is presented as a worldview, a worldview that is able through which to explain the world and the existence of human beings, right? Like the Nazi Völkisch anti-Semitism would be a comprehensive way of our understanding and analyzing our world. And according to this argument and this claim, Islamophobia is not like that. Rather, Islamophobia has a certain function and is used, but it is not a comprehensive worldview. And the argument then goes that one of the key differences is that you basically do not have any conspiracy theories when you speak about Islamophobia but rather Islamophobia is against uh, the marginal other, 
while anti-Semitism is against the imagined powerful Jew, right? Um, I think empirically, even from the very beginning on, when Islamophobia became like an important political tool for a lot of uh, the party politics in Western Europe, that was not true. And this is just like one example out of many that I could give you. I mean, we all remember what Anders Bering Breivik, the guy who murdered 77 people in Norway in 2011, when he published his manifesto, what he was arguing. It was, the manifesto was there, and the reason why he killed 77 socialist uh, youth folks in, during a, a youth camp was because he, again, saw them as enablers of multiculturalism, which is for them an enabler for Islamization. But even if you look into the programs of a lot of these folks um, who published all of these anti-Muslim publications, you could see a lot of conspiracy theories going on. And I would even go further and argue that not only for anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, but basically for every kind of racism, every form of racism, you find this idea of a conspiracy, a conspiracy that is going on against the dominant group, however it may perceive itself. And this is just one example here. Now just read that out um, from one of the most important German authors when he uh, argued, no pope, no cardinal, no politician has demonstrated commitment to the interest of Islam, economic liberalism, the mafia and Freemasonry as comprehensively as Pope, uh, pope John Paul II. The argument that he's making here is that there is a secret alignment. And this is the, the basic idea of the notion of Eurabia that was popularized in Europe, speaking of this idea of um, a secretive alliance between the EU elite, the elite of the European Union, alongside um, having a, a contract with uh, the Arab League and trying to reshape the uh, European population to Islamize the continent. Um, and you will find that in so many incidents. I think one important aspect that I, I would like to, uh, to briefly mention here is what is, has been called the Jerusalem Declaration in 2010. And I think that is key to our understanding of the mainstreaming of Islamophobia and also the, the attempt to mobilize also Jews for the sake of Islamophobia because what we saw until 2010 was basically that all of the far right had one larger problem facing its reputation as being an old fashioned fascist or neo-Nazi political party. And all of these far right parties from the Front National of Marine Le Pen to the Sweden Democrats, to the Freedom Party of Austria, to the Vlams uh, <clears throat> Belang in Belgium and whatever their names might, might be. No one of them was really, has ever become really mainstream until the early 2000s. And one of the reasons was because they were clearly seen because there are these historical relationships, right? They were seen as inheritors of a Nazi or a fascist political party. Because that's also what, what they are at the end of the day. But what happened um, was that with Tim Fortin and his introduction of a new style of right-wing populism, he tried to reframe the far-right strategy in making it a way of trying to mobilize against Muslims in the name of liberalism, but also in the name of fighting anti-Semitism. Mm. And by that, trying to win over the Jewish votes while clearly they have not been successful to a full extent, but they have gained something. And the Jerusalem Declaration of 2010 is the best um, public um, um, institution that we have seen so far. What happened in 2010? And just to give you an understanding of how uh, the whole political landscape has, has reshaped, when the first time in the European Union, a far-right political party became a member um, within a European nation state uh, to become a coalition partner and govern. That was in the year 2000 in Austria. The reaction was that 
every other European Union uh, member state boycotted Austria on a diplomatic level, right? Back then it was Jörg Haider still. So there was a reason Jörg Haider was not allowed even to enter Israel because he was widely regarded as being the inheritor of a, an ex party from four ex Nazis by ex Nazis, right? That was like the, the talk that these days back then. In 2010, the first delegation of, far, of not only one far right political party, but a whole delegation of far right political parties made its way to uh, Jerusalem and met with some far right Knesset folks <clears throat> to basically, um, and you can find this Jerusalem declaration, declaration online to position itself and to position Israel as being at the vanguard of fighting Islamization and at the border of the frontiers of the Judeo-Christian civilization. So we see a shift in the, in the, in the discourse that, that they were successful to reshape um, in the late 90s throughout the, 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 the first uh, 10 years of the 2000s to basically have this presence of the far right in Israel. And I think alongside there was also other movements that were happening on one hand, Donald Trump becoming president of the United States. 15 years later, uh, before, no far right politician would ha ever have been welcomed with the Republican party, right? Now in 2016, that was the case. You had a lot of far right folks going to the inauguration, right? So we had this shift in the United States to the far right, in Europe to the far right, and in Israel with Netanyahu to the far right, who also worked with the anti-Semites, like Viktor Orban, for instance, who were super anti-Semitic within their own European nation state, but trying like to, um, to present themselves as the preservers and the defenders um, of uh, the Judeo-Christian civilization vis-a-vis -vis, uh, so-called Muslim, uh, the Islamization threat. All right, I'm coming to my end here. Um, so if you're more interested <clears throat> in a detailed analysis again, now this is just like, and, and I'll end with, with, with this here. Um, this is actually not from Europe, this is from the US, but uh, you can find this kind of discourse also very much, uh, very much so uh, in Europe. And Viktor Orban, the Hungarian, again, centrist right politician from a Christian democratic party, the Fidesz, um, was one of the main propagators of this idea. And he had done a lot against the millionaire Soros uh, not least also to uh, ban uh, the Central European University, which was back then still located in Budapest, uh, which who basically had to pack their stuff and go and uh, resettle in Vienna. The idea, and I think that is interesting in historical terms, because if we go back, for instance, um, prior to 1492, to the Reconquista of Andalusia, by Catholic uh, monarchs. The idea was that Jews and Muslims, when they had either to convert to Christianity or leave the continent, they were the threat to uh, the perceived white Christian identity. And back then, um, the idea of, for instance, Jews um, poisoning the dwells in order to kill Christian uh, populations in smaller towns in Andalusia, they were instigated according to the legend by Muslim Turks, right? Mm -hmm. So this, there was always this imagination of Jews who were, before they became white, as I would call it, they were regarded as the Oriental other within Europe versus the Muslims were the Oriental other outside of Europe. And one of the things that are re-emerging here with this picture of Soros, who is the image of the wealthy, powerful Jew, is he lets in all those ISIL terrorists, Mexican and Argentinians, to basically reshape the domestic um, population of white Americans. And that is very much also the same discourse that we have been witnessing throughout um, many European uh, countries. So yeah, um, you know, um, this is some of the thoughts that I, I thought were 
would be interesting to share because they show us to what extent uh, the figure of the Jew and the figure of the Muslim as the ultimate other to European white Christian identity construction, really not only in the past, but also in the contemporary time serves uh, mm -hmm. the preservation and the defense of this white, imagined white Christian identity. And I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, so thank you, Fareed. So I have um, a couple of questions, and then I want to ask a third question, which is a personal question about Fareed. Um, life but let me just let me just say a couple of things so the picture in the united states is a little bit different in terms of anti-semitism and islamophobia um one of the major reasons and i'm just going to say this because i know there are students online in here is that we have something called religious freedom which is fundamentally very different from being a Muslim or a Jew in France or in Germany or in Austria, although Austria doesn't have the same kind of rules that France and Germany do in terms of the secular. So that's one thing. The second thing is that when you say that there is this comprehensive view in terms of anti-Semitism, that sounds very odd to the Muslims here, but would it sound odd to the Muslims in Europe in terms of the history of Muslims in Europe and Jews in Europe versus the history between Jews and Muslims in the United States? You see what I'm saying? So when you say there's a comprehensive view of anti-Semitism, what comprehensive view and from whose view is that comprehensive? All right. Well, first of all, I mean, I think regarding your, your first comment, you're absolutely right. I think that is one of the major uh, distinctions um, that is also shaping uh, the reality of uh, Muslims and Jews. Uh, if you look, um, take as an example, the, the, the whole debate about circumcision, male circumcision, right? Um, and the ban of male circumcision in, in various parts of Europe. Uh, that is very much um, going against primarily the Muslim and the Jewish um, male folks. And obviously the question of religious freedom fundamentally shapes the place they can have mm -hmm. and also the way how they are perceived. Because I think in addition to religious freedom, I think the other thing is also in a way the question of race and how race is dealt with. I think the fact, no matter how many problems for people have here in the States with, with race relations, but the fact that in, at least in continental Europe, if we leave the UK aside, I would argue that the non-existence of the notion of race in the everyday language is one of the major reasons for also the denial of racism and the imagination of a post-racial order after 1945 that did not allow to also connect the contemporary to the anti-Semitism, right? Because on one hand, anti-Semitism, yes, in Germany, Austria, and in the Nazi regime, it ended in the Holocaust, but it is much more also than the Holocaust. And there is also a history of anti-Semitism apart from the Holocaust, right? In many other parts of the world. Including the United States. Sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And I think this inability to see race as an analytical category by, with the help of erasing it from the vocabulary and thus from the public imagination because we are all human beings, right? Especially the French version. We're all equal. We are all Republican in this fourth Republic of France, right? In the fifth Republic. So the idea really is 
there is no way, no place for marginalization of the ethnic other or the racial other. Um, this alongside with uh, religious discrimination, I mean, the French case is a very, <laughs> I would argue the most hostile mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, um, case that you could take in Europe. Um, but even beyond, beyond France, I think this idea, these are the ideas that shape the inability also of many, in many Western societies not to come to terms in Europe um, with the racial discrimination that is going on. Yeah, so that's like, um, um, I, I fully agree with that. And the, the other thing um, with the comprehensiveness of, of antisemitism, um, I don't know if, if I was able to explain myself that well. Yeah, I want but, you to explain that a little bit. Because a lot of the antisemitism scholars uh, who uh, defend uh, their argument that antisemitism cannot ever be compared to anything, right? That this is the claim is because they argue um, anti-Semitism is an all explanatory ideology, okay? So with anti-Semitism, you can explain the whole world and everything that is going on. Therefore, it is much more than any form of racism. Mm -hmm. But I think obviously, I mean, that is not the, this is abs absolutely not the Anglo-Saxon uh, debate that we have in the United States, in the UK, and other places. It's very much a German debate, I would argue. And I think it's very much linked to this fear of never again could be again. Mm -hmm. and, and, and by that also meaning that um, we, we never ever want to talk about it because, and, and, you know, I mean, this is something that I, that I have experienced in many ways. Um, whenever I, I started conversations in the public, I remember one day, one time I, I did this presentation that was with US students coming to Austria. And I was in the diplomatic academy, which is kind of the institution that trains the future diplomatic uh, staff in the foreign ministry. So there was only one Austrian in that room. Mm. And, you know, I gave this example. I, I, I read the students like um, a quote from a, from a politician in, in, in the parliament but I exchanged the word Muslim with Jew. And then I asked them, is this anti-Semitic? And they were saying, oh, awesome. They were saying, yes, yes, sure, it's anti-Semitic. And I was like, you know, the original quote is, that was Muslim, not, not Jew. So afterwards, the only person that challenged me, not in the public, but rather like personally, was this Austrian diplomat. Yeah. He would say, you can never do that. And I said, why can I never do that? Because you don't know how we Austrians, right? We Austrians, which is already like an issue. And you know, that shows you how enable, how, how much the inability of them really to have a critical <laughs> a, a, a analysis of their own status quo and a critical self-reflection, which is just not there. You cannot understand what we went through with killing the Jew. That's, and, and you know, like linking anti-Semitism per definition to the Holocaust and not having the ability to see, well, actually the Nuremberg laws were based on the US race laws. You forgot that, but that, that is not a discussion that is happening in, in countries like Germany and Austria. In Germany and Austria, we see the world like antisemitism was uh, the guilt of the Nazis. So we have to be free from that guilt. And that's why we don't wanna have any comparative discussion here. And I think this is much more what is lurking behind this debate. It's this political moment mm -hmm. of, of- We have yeah. that political moment going on here too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and we have that, you know, in terms of perhaps not so much a focus on anti-Semitism, although we could talk about anti-Semitism in the United States and Henry Ford and all kinds of stuff or Islamophobia. But, you know, we have a lot of issues about African American slavery or genocide, Native American genocide. So we have that, okay, we, you know, we didn't do that um, yeah. moment too. And there's a lot going on in educational systems and higher ed where there's pushback on this kind of critical thinking, not even critical racing, but just critical thinking. So it's not that 
you know, you ha- I think there is, a, there is a movement that you talked about, this nationalism, you know, starting, mm-hmm. say, starting from 2015. But I want to just, um, I don't want to take up a lot of time. And, you know, mm-hmm. we started a little late. But I want to go to you, Fred, because I want people in the audience to understand what is Islamophobia in action, right? Mm-hmm. And um, in 2020, November 9th, um, you were at home with your family and the Austrian forces, <clears throat> I would say kind of a paramilitary, right? Special forces. Special yeah. forces mm-hmm. entered your house and basically raided your house, but you discovered they were watching you, mm-hmm. that you were accused of terrorism terrorizing the Egyptian government and also um, basically being an internal sort of, you know, person that was Austrian, but was really working for the Islamicist, right? The extreme party. And so what happened then? I mean, this is, this is, a, I mean, you know, I'm Muslim and if I'm asleep at night and you know, the U.S. military comes into my house, and I mean, it has happened to some people. But they came into my house. I would be terrorized. How would I ever live there, feeling like I'm an American? Mm-hmm. Um, how do you respond to that in terms of not just Islamophobia, but also what's your identity? You're a Muslim, European, right? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> After that happened, right? Um, actually, I've not taught in public so much about it, uh, at least beyond Austria. Um, but I think, I mean, the short answer is that's why I'm here, because that happened there. That's the one thing, right? Um, you know, you, you mentioned at the very beginning that I, I, one of the things that I was doing is also this European Islamophobia report, so which is basically a collective work of more than 40 scholars every year, and we cover more than 30 countries in Europe. And you know, given what I've just described and the environment of how few things you can say about these issues in a critical way, you can assume what the reaction was, not only from one country, but 30 countries, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I myself, I would never have thought that something like that could happen because I always believed in the idea that a democracy is a democracy. And I'm an academic, like I've been writing about all of this like for my last 10 to 15 years. And I would never ever think and never ever have thought. And I I mean, I, I knew that these people were not clean right? These politicians who were in charge of that. But I would never ever have thought that somebody would put the gun on my four-year-old child at four o'clock in the morning, at five, five o'clock in the morning, and before that storm my house and break my door, and then call me a terrorist, which I'm like, legally speaking, I'm still a terrorist suspect in Austria. Uh, My bank account is frozen, my assets were frozen, they basically chased me out of the country. That's how I would describe it. But, you know, as a self, as I, I would argue that I'm a self critical person, right? I think about what is happening to me, my own position. You know, as somebody who is in academia, you have the luxury to do that. Uh, you're not always caught yeah. up yeah. in a way. Um, And it made me rethink democracy. It made me rethink what it means as somebody who is framed and otherized in this way, what what that implies if you are representing first and foremost a working class people of color, which is like I am, you know, we were just talking like before about like the percentage of faculty of color here in a lot of the US academia. And there is a lot of critique going on here, but I was, I think, the only person of color in my faculty, right? So 
I am part of a generation that is that where the majority is definitely not represented in academia or any positions of power. And what, what that means and implies and how endangered you can be in such a situation. Now, the other aspect is because of my critique, you know, going through the files that they are constantly writing about me, which I can always access like two, three months later, I once read a piece where they were saying, like speaking about Islamophobia is a means to create a worldwide caliphate, right? Kind of an Islamic state in Europe. And it's like, you know, 10 years ago, I read this stuff in the conspiracy theories of the far right folks. Now I'm reading this written by the secret service. And it's like, what is happening here? And about you. And about me, <laughs> which is the other thing. But you know, conspiracies are conspiracies. As, in, as Jean Paul Sartre said so famously, if the Jew did not exist, the anti Semite would invent him, right? The Jew, the figure of the Jew is an imagination. It's not about the reality of Jewish life or Jewish religion. And as much I see the whole idea about the Muslim threat, it's not about Islam and Muslims, it's not about me and you. It's about their imagination, it's their projection as Edward Said has called it in his Orientalism. So, but it let, lets me rethink what that means when within 10 years, you find this far right ideology being like in co consciously written by the state bureaucracy and then legitimizing an act of intimidating like my private life as a public critic that raises questions as to the standard and the and and to the the, di the direction like which we are going to. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Oop. Did I just get rid of them? Oops. Okay. Um, so I mean, one of the things that you know, I'm really happy you're here. I'm happy I could bring you here, even though you're at Williams for a couple of years, right? Um, and I'm sorry for your family and your kids. And I'm sure, how, I mean, I don't know how one would react to that, but I'm sure they're traumatized in a sense, but I hope they're settling in, in, in the United States. But one of the things is that I think there is a lot of fear that some of us have, um, not just about homophobia and anti-Semitism, because unfortunately, most of us are used to it in terms of racism, but I think there's a fear of how it might turn, what wave we might see. Uh, we just had a meeting recently in Riverdale with council member Eric Dinowitz and a bunch of people here talking about what long-term long solutions can we have rather than having these rallies and standing at the monument, uh, which we've done unfortunately so many times because of vandalism or violence or anti-Semitism even Islamophobia and anti-Black racism. So I think that that's a fear that some community leaders have. Um, so I just want to open it up to you. If you have a question, if you could type it into the chat, it would be great. Um, I also open it up to our audience here. Um, if you have any questions or if you have maybe something you want for you to qual uh, clarify in his presentation. <clears throat> Uh, Chris Uber, um, can you talk about the whole Austrian Germany view that it's the habit of guilt? Mm -hmm. I spent some of the week in Germany and I was getting tattooed and talking to the guy from Germany at my age. But he was discussing what you know, the younger generation of Germany is trying to actually acknowledge and talk about what had happened because his parents and grandparents were being talked about. Yeah. 
Okay, the, the question is, how does media influence ra racial relations in Austria? Yeah, and the, and the question of the guild. Um, I mean, first of all, I think there is uh, one, one major uh, difference between Germany and Austria. Austria, like publicly um, in its self-understanding was like the first victim of Nazi Germany. So it took them much, much longer until the late 1980s with the Kurt Waldheim affair to acknowledge their role in the Nazi regime as participatory uh, role in the Nazi regime. So, you know, compared also to Germany, like we don't have no single center for anti-Semitism studies. You know, I mean, can you imagine that Austria? And you know, that, that is the difference because yes, you had slavery and you had the civil, uh, <coughs> civil rights era but what then existed is like institutions that were built, like all the black studies and African-American studies department. I mean, no single center for anti-Semitism studies, like, come on. You know, that tells you something like how eager or not they are in terms of tackling certain issues, right? And, and I think Germany is much, much more beyond Austria, I would argue. Um, you know, for the younger generation, yes, I think there is a shift. And, you know, um, I would also say there are a lot of nice people in those two countries, but the question is really what is the political leadership making out of that? Um, I mean, when, when uh, there was one conference recently, um, I think one or two years ago, on anti-Semitism on a global scale and the Austrian uh, government in, invited uh, uh, um, to this conference, people from all over the world. But you know, their idea on a domestic level is that the new anti-Semites are the Muslims. You know, that, that's the way how they deal with that. And that's the scholarship that they want, they, that they support to be produced. So you have in the media then the debate about anti-Semitism within the marginalized working class people of color, poor Muslim folks, right? And that's what like from the political side, what they're trying to support. Um, yeah, so that's also, that's already talking a bit about the, the media, but um, I mean, in terms of media, um, I think there are, there is two different aspects. I think that's also another factor that fully reshapes the, the relationship in a different way compared to the US. Europe is traditionally, historically speaking, um, home to strong states, welfare state with a lot of good institutions, but also implying that the state is very strong, mm. which also means that the control over different fields that here are part of the free market, over there, they are under state control or at least heavily impacted by those in power. And that's also true for media. I mean, if you look, especially let's, given the case of Austria, we had so many scandals within the last few years, which revealed the, the way how politicians tried to have a major impact by paying money, basically, through like ministries and go governmental departments. But you know, having a say in what, what is on the agenda and what is not. So I think that you know, while here you have a very divided society between like the Fox News and the CNN News watches, over there you have a state television that is hegemonic, right? Yes, you have the far right that challenges this, but only to a certain extent. And that I think also um, gives this a whole other dynamic. And at the same time, you know, given that racism is so hegemonic in a much more subtle way, it is also more problematic, I think, you know, because it is like, it is this consciousness that is shared throughout the dominant power structures, but that are never questioned, because if you question it, you're gonna be out, right? As long as I was criticizing the far right, and uh, you've read that in my mm. bio, I won awards, right? I was very much invited to come here and there, but once, I turned my critique to the power structures, then they raided my house. Yes. They basically backed me, but the contract ended and 
anyway, I said, that's a, it's good that these two moments come together. Yeah. Now that was good from the university side. Any other questions in the room or online? Stephen. Not so much related to what you said, but as an expert in the field, something that has been going for the past uh, five nine years. So, in one sense, let me frame it this way: I would be curious. I am curious to know the etymology of the term Islamophobia and to unpack why. Anti Semitism, for example, is against Semitism, um, anti gay, et cetera, et cetera. Right? The term Islamophobia, and I'm not, please don't misunderstand this, I'm not in favor of Islamophobia. I just find the term problematic because if someone has a phobia about heights, so, oh, that's really too bad. Maybe you should see a psychiatrist, right? If I have a phobia about X, Y, or Z, you know, we have a very different attitude. Who adopted the term Islamophobia? Who mm -hmm. created that? Where does it go, come from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Homophobia. Right. There's another example. Right. Yeah. Right. That's right. the that's well, I'd like to well, time ago, so maybe it's not appropriate to answer that. Yes and no. Um, uh, there are some historians who worked on that. So what they found is two sources, original sources, one in France during the time of colonization and one by an Italian uh, convert to Islam, Ramad Ra, um, who was working on, on Europe and its perspective on Islam. It was later also used by people like Edward Said in the mm -hmm. 80s, but it became popular with Iranimid Trusts, which is a think, an anti-racist think tank that published a report in 1997. But you know, I mean, I get your point. It's very new. In other words, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I think the way how it is used currently is basically going back to the 1997 uh, definition that was proposed by the Runnymede Trust. And there, there has been indeed a lot of semantic debate also about uh, this terminology. And I would argue um, to quote Wolfgang Benz on anti Semitism, because he was the head of the anti uh, Center for Anti Semitism Studies. He said, anti-Semitism is an awful word, but we all know what we mean by that. I mean, I mean the, the Semite is also the Arab, right? But when we speak about anti-Semitism, we basically mean the Jew, not the Arab. So it is like a word that has, has received, like it got some meaning after a while. Um, in Islamophobia studies, as an academic endeavor, I would argue that there are three, four different approaches to the study of Islamophobia. Um, and the most dominant one, I would argue, is the one which is basically seeing, and that's how I use it, so I did not explain it, uh, which is Islamophobia is basically anti-Muslim racism. So it is a form of racism, as much as I could speak of anti-Semitism as, as anti-Jewish racism. Um, yeah. And I... Long answer short, but yeah, I mean, there's a long, yeah. long one here. But we have one question that I'm going to take. Um, I think it was um, how, not this one. Would you speak about how Islamophobia dog whistlers differ globally? I think in in the in our current times, I think one of the major. Um, driving forces of Islamophobia is really the global war on terror. I think this has institutionalized in many ways, a, be it like I wrote a book on Islamophobia in Muslim majority societies, right? So just to unpack this idea of um, Islamophobia is something, you know, 
coming from white Western folks. No, mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -mm. It and you know the decolonial thinkers, writers who write about Islamophobia, they draw a lot on 4092 as kind of the beginning of a new era of a racial capital hierarchy um, and a world order in which basically white supremacy uh, became the top of this hierarchy and the war on terror being kind of the expansion of this very global world order. And I think, you know, if you go to China today and you look at the minority of the Jing in Xinjiang, you know, they're fighting these uh, Muslim uh, native people there in the name of the war on terror, right? Yeah. The same in Muslim majority countries where, um, you know, Myanmar what, was the same. Right? Myanmar, yeah. the same, or like where you have nation states that are ruled by Muslim folks, where they try to crack down mm -hmm. on the opposition, whatever it might be, in the name of the war on terror. So you have different shades of the materialization and manifestation of this war on terror in terms of discriminating Muslim people, in terms of questioning their humanness and their equality. From Guantanamo Bay to many of these, uh, of these policies that we are witnessing or genocides, uh, if you want so, um, in, in, in countries like Myanmar. Um, I think it, in, in these days, it's very much drawing on this institution of the global war on terror because that is giving the legitimacy to make a difference between the Muslim other and the rest. All right, wait, it is 8.11 and we're gonna have to, um, I, want, I want, you know, free to enjoy himself too in New York. So um, I wanted to thank everyone who came tonight um, in the audience as well as online. And I just wanna leave you with one thought. I think that, you know, the sort of challenging issues that especially HGI deals with, that Freed and I deal with, whether it's Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, Holocaust, genocide, even into religious relations, there is no other place to do it but the United States. And I think that is something that is very optimistic for me as a Muslim woman, uh, living here freely and having the opportunity to have these conversations as well as heading a center like I do at a Catholic college. So I will leave you with optimism and peace and hope, and inshallah, we'll see you again. Thank you so much. Good night.